Welcome to the Valve Studio. My journey to Tone Hinge continues. This week I'm going to talk about electronics. But first let me get you a little introduction. So I build uh, vacuum tube guitar amplifiers back in my development lab. And I need to build five of these um, enclosures, speaker cabinets for 12 inch woofers. They all need to be identical. I made this one by hand as my, uh, my prototype and it went together pretty well. I want to be able to in the future be able to design different types of speaker cabinets as well that are not rectangular. That's the reason why I bought this Work B. This is a Work B 1010. Let me move my cabinet out of the way so you can see my progress. So I have the uh, all the mechanical things put together and I'll talk a little bit about what I found this week and some other things about design uh, and the electronics and all the aspects around the control system for this uh, CNC machine. Let's push this back. Uh, first thing I did was after I got it all together, um, remember now this work B is going to reside down in this workbench underneath the surface, and then I'm going to lift it up. I'm going to take this top part off and then the whole work B will come up and do, I'll do my work and then I can put it back down and get my work surface back again. All my other tools do the same thing. So I worked on the lift system, uh, this week. Um, I have a wide variety of things going on there. I don't really have kind of a finalized plan yet, but I'll be talking about that in the future. Um, but after I got this all together, what I realized was that this, this thing, because it's on a lift system, uh, may not actually be on a, on a flat surface like this. And because of that, this drag chain over here on the Y axis will actually sit out in free space. So it needs a shelf to kind of reside along. So I went to Home Depot and I found um, this uh, angled aluminum. This is an inch and a half by an inch and a half. And that, um, I ended up putting it right here. I 3D printed some spacers so that I could attach this um, into the end piece of this front and back piece of, you know, this front and back piece of the frame. I tapped these holes with M5s and then I, um, just put this here so this drag chain here won't don't kind of dangle out in free space. It's going to be able to move back and forth. Um, let me see what else did I do? Uh, I'll show you a picture of the challenge here. You put it all together mechanically and then you end up doing all the electrical work. It turns out the Z at limit switch is a, is a pretty tight area to get the screws, the mounting screws to get it to get it in there. I'll show you a picture of that. It's kind of tucked way up underneath here, and then you have to have the, the solder, you have to have your wires soldered on before you put the switch in. Uh, and that's where I ran into some problems. I was realizing uh, what, what, what length of wire do I hook up? Um, so I, I kind of had to put a stop to uh, what I was working on. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. All right, so <clears throat> I got a lot of parts in. Uh, got an e-stop switch here. I pulled this out of something else and I got in um, a misting system. I'm going to blow compressed air through this to blow, uh, you know, chips out of the work surface. And so I need to be able to attach this to my uh, spindle mount. You know, the spindle mount sits and resides right here and I need to attach this somehow. And unfortunately this valve is not in a very good position and it's really hard to turn and I, you know it's not going to work out right so i gotta do a little bit more work on my on this uh, my my so-called mist system i'm not going to run coolant in this i'm just going to run compressed air and i got in well i started looking well I'll just talk about, we're going to be all over the map tonight uh, on the, on the uh, elevation of the lifting this platform up and down inside the workbench, I started looking at uh, using linear actuators, but it turns out I don't have enough space down here to actually have a linear actuator. This needs to go up. I want the top of my motor to, you know, basically 
if I move Z down with the router in there, I have a certain height here from the edge of this surface here up to the top of my motor. And it needs to, I need, that's my travel distance on my platform. Uh, one, I don't have linear actuators that long. And if they were that long, this portion of the linear actuator would be equal that um, length or more. So then now I need twice that distance to hold a linear actuator underneath there. If I'm just going to push it from the bottom and have this thing go up and down. So I decided to not use linear actuators. That's a pretty expensive option anyway. Like this little guy here is a, this is probably a six incher and it cost me about $65. Um, very forceful though. Got a lot of force to it. Uh, I looked at drag, ch I looked at chain driven systems. I looked at, you know, what do I use for differently kind of lead screws? I don't quite know what I'm going to do there. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, I got some of uh, these Rockler vacuum clamps. You basically pull a vacuum on these, on, on the ends here. And I got about six of these and then you can put your stock down and it'll hold it down. And and uh, I got these not for holding uh, work surfaces down horizontally when I'm having it in the, um, what is this one going to be? The XY plane. Not, I don't think I'll use this. I might use it. I, I don't quite know yet. But what I really got it for was that enclosure's got um, uh, finger joints, you know, so the, so the, it's joined together with finger joints on the end of the pieces. So I need a way... I can't do a finger joints this way because I'll end up with a, a, round, a rounded uh, groove and then I won't, be, I won't have a very good seal there. So I need to be able to route my finger joints this way. So uh, there'll be future videos about the mounting system here, but I basically want to mount these, these vacuum clamps vertically like this and then be able to put my stock in like this underneath the table because remember there's no wood there's no base to this. It's kind of floating out in free space. You know, there is a, a sacrificial piece of wood up here, but I'm going to pull off a piece of it. And these will be located underneath there on a, on a vertical. Then I'll be able to put my stock in like this, and then my, my router will be able to come through and actually do the ends of my stock. We'll talk a lot more about that. I got a vacuum pump for these. You know, these require that you be able to pull X and M amount of vacuum off there and if you want to buy a vacuum pump for these things it's fairly expensive it's about $350 for the last 18 months I've been um, working for a cryogenics, comp cryogenics pump company here in Montrose and um, uh, they have these things called a roughing pump where they kind of suck the majority of the air out of a chamber and uh, a roughing pump is a great vacuum pump. So they had a spare one. They, they went ahead and let me use it. And it's a monster. I'll show it to you. Oh my God, it weighs about 80 pounds. <laughs> so this, this is my vacuum pump. I know it's a monster. Um, and I'm probably going to bend the stock with a, I put it on those clamps. But we got to figure out the plumbing aspect to get to get the vacuum from this crazily heavy pump up to those little tiny rock rockler squares all right what's next here uh oh okay so let's get down to business let's talk about electronics here i got to the point where i was like all right i got my drag change installed let's start really wiring this up and and get it going the uh original work B design has the um, they I think they call it I don't know the CNC X CNC Pro it's a um, controller board that runs Gerbil and has the motor drivers built on the back of it and they typically in their design they'll mount it on the back side back here and that means that they got to get all the wires in the central location right here uh, including the USB cable, you know, go, going over to your your actually control computer. So Gerbil's running on here, and then they run all the wires down from the uh, the Z motion here. This motor is really close, so you can just run it right over. And then this drag chain here takes the feedback from the 
the the back stepper motors connected at the ends of the back of the Y back up in here and this is actually a pretty good location for this um, but I it you know I, I want to have a little bit of different system here well, let's talk a little bit about the uh, CNC world for the do-it-yourselfer uh, Gerbil is uh, basically runs an Arduino um, right here this is and you'll end up putting the shield on here with the with the uh, motor drivers on it and there's been a lot of work on Gerbil in the I think Gerbil came out what did I read 2005 no that was when Arduino came out I don't know Gerbil's been around for a pretty long time they're, they're at version current currently they're at version 1.1 G and uh, they have maxed out the performance of this little tiny processor. This is called AT Mega 328. This was uh, introduced into the world in 1997, so it is 21 years old. It's an 8-bit microprocessor with X number of you know RAM. I think it's got 32K of RAM. No, I I don't know the the specs of it, but it the point is it's an eight it's a 8-bit processor running at 16 megahertz and Gerbil is maxing out everything on here and you know if you we're gonna get pretty technical here on the, on what Gerbil does so on a microprocessor like this you have digital output pins and that's what they're using to control the uh, stepper drivers and stepper drivers require that um, you know you adhere to the sh to the uh, some minimum some minimum widths for your pulse widths and that type of thing and then because this is a coordinated motion control system for three axis it's got to coordinate a lot of the steps uh, to get all the axis to move simultaneously at the you know in a, in a with, with periodicity so it's it's like it's it's very close to real-time controller Gerbil is using an interrupt uh, based approach over here to con and then they have a bunch of hardware uh, software to control the hardware bits to do all the bit manipulation to move the motors uh, and, and <clears throat> they they really can't expand upon this and so uh, a lot of people want to have a um, they want to display it they, they want a digital readout so <clears throat> the approach in the if you're if you're taking the Gerbil route um, you have to have another computer over here to run your your HMI your, your your human machine interface and this is where you'll put you know your laptop or you put you know you you get a beagle bone you know or you get a raspberry pi and then you run uh you know your or your laptop and you run universal g code sender or you run uh chili pepper or some other things um, and then if you want to display on here with if you're using one of these other uh, Linux machines you get a you get a small display this is a 7 inch HDMI display and this is a touch screen as well so you put your your you know your your man machine interface on on this all right so that's all fine and there's a lot of videos and there's a ton of people showing you how to do this and um, uh, but but the point is of all this is that this thing is really at its max it really you know it's it's this thing can't go to four axis um, uh, performance wise it has a um, if you're micro stepping at some outrageous amount of micro steps like these integrated step servo motors will do da up to 50,000 steps per per rotation which is crazy if you want to run it that fast, you really got to send those steps at a, at a really fast rate to get it to actually have any kind of feed rate. This is incapable of doing that. This is this is limited to the interrupt latency of the microprocessor, and so I think the uh, refresh rate on the uh, interrupt driven uh, um, code here that controls the this for step control is about 30 kilohertz. All right. So, 
that's all fine. And a lot of people do this and it works fine. Um, when you boot up your work B, if you are going down the Gerbil route, this board will come out at reset in like, I don't know, probably a millisecond or so, and then it's ready to go. Uh, it's got to go through the, oop, ah! well, that's not working. <laughs> this thing is going to go through its, uh, its uh, uni, this is a Uno, so it's probably running in Uniboot. It's got to get through its U bootloader, and so maybe, I don't know, two seconds later, this thing is ready to go. Um, in the meantime, you know, your motor drivers are doing things because the the drivers are not in the right state, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, let's just keep going. So my point is, is that if you want to go to four axis, like I want to run a, I want to run an A axis here for whatever reason, um, can't do that with this. We'll have to do something else. On the other, you know, there is a project called the Beagle G, which is a G code interpreter for the Beagle Bone, and it uses the um, it's called uh, the real time unit, programmable real time units in this uh, Satera processor from TI. And they can uh, basically, there's two additional 32 bit cores in here in addition to the ARM core that's, that's on a Beagle Bone. And uh, this guy named Henner is working on Beagle G. I, I looked into using a Beagle Bone as well because I got a bunch of these left over from another project. And. Um, I decided to not do that. Um, uh, Beagle G just, it, uh, the maturity level isn't quite there. And then I had the same issue with, I have now Beagle G running. I have to uh, communicate with it locally and then come up with a, an interface um, for my man machine interface and write that in something else and hook it onto this thing and communicate with it over a serial link. And, you know, there's, uh, it's just, it's, that's, uh, well, it complicates our little simple machine here. Uh, I can just go down the, the real route and buy a real CNC controller. And, but uh, I don't learn anything from that. So it's, this whole thing here is a learning process. Build those speaker cabinets, the learning process, me doing guitar amplifiers in there. It's about learning guitar amplifiers and tube amplifier design. So this is my passion to learn something new. And so how do I take that, all that quest for knowledge and turn it into something that's going to be usable. So this thing here is a Cypress uh, uh, PSOC 5 LP. This is a ARM M3 running, this is a 32-bit ARM M3, it's got runs about, you clock this up to 88, 80, 80 megahertz. And um, this is a, it's a little hard to explain, it stands for Programmable System on Chip. But what's actually in here is an ARM core, an, an ARM3, uh, M3 core, and it has a bunch of uh, generic analog and digital building blocks. Um, and you, and a cross, and a couple of cross matrices where you can cross couple things together, much like the way an FPGA works. Um, but it's got analog section with it as well, not just ADD converters, but it has op amps, analog comparators. Um, filters. There's a bunch of stuff that it has in there on the analog side and then it has a bunch of generic digital blocks and the tool called PSOC Creator allows you to pull out libraries of soft components like a UART or a counter or whatever and it knows how to take those generic digital blocks and wire them together to implement higher order functions. And so what you can do with that is um, create a bunch of digital analog circuitry and couple it internal to the M3 processor. Uh, so that's, uh, I was like, well, this is perfect. Is there a port of Gerbil to this board? It turns out that there is. Uh, th and this is a port, there's, there's a couple of these ports out there. 
What's difficult about porting the Arduino code is it doesn't have a HAL in it. It doesn't have a hardware abstraction layer. So they're working on that. Sonny Leone is now the maintainer of Gerbil. And uh, I wrote him to find out the status of, of the howling, the adding a howl interface to Gerbil. And that makes it so that they can port the majority of, of Gerbil to a new platform. And then they'll just rework the underlying hardware manipulation thing, but they have a generic interface level that layer there where all the planning and, and motion control is done by the microprocessor and then all the low levels um, you know, port manipulations done that's unique to the processor. That doesn't exist yet, but somebody took the, uh, the Gerbil code 1.1 G and they ported it to this PSOC processor and they took out all that timing and port manipulation that Gerbil spends an enormous amount of time on and they, they implemented it in hardware. Now, that's like really cool because the Arduino is sitting there getting hammered by with these with these interrupts to and state maps to control the stepping stepping states of the three axis. So things like uh, you're going to send a step out. So this a step has a minimal pulse width, so it's got to go high for a certain amount of time and then go back low. And they don't do weights in that particular type of code. They'll set up an interrupt and then they need to set up another interrupt, you know, X number of microseconds later to, you know, deassert that step. Uh, and so it's really quite complicated. If you can move all that, push all that out into hardware and let a hardware component take care of that, then the microprocessor is free to do more. Since the eight megahertz Arduino is maxed out you can't add additional features but this thing because you've pushed a lot of the the um, all that bit manipulation out into hardware the processor over here has got a lot more uh, you know area to do other things in addition to its motion planning uh, um, you know its route planning and the motion control system it can do other things and so Long story short, let's talk about what this system is actually going to have in place. What I'd ideally like is a very simple control system for, for my work bee. I don't want a touch screen. I don't want to put a Raspberry Pi on here. I don't want to boot up a Raspberry Pi. I don't want to worry about all the stuff that goes along with that. I don't bother commenting and say, those are easy to get going, blah, blah, blah. I've been doing embedded Linux since 1999. So I'm really well versed in getting the BeagleBone to work, Raspberry Pis to work, ARMs, power PCs, all that stuff. I know how to get all that working. I'm not afraid of doing that. It's just complicated. And touchscreen interfaces don't really have a tactile feel because when I started learning, I'm by no means a CNC expert. But my friend Rob allows me to use a couple of machines over in his shop. And he has an old Miltronics. Um, and I've been doing, uh, it's not manual machining, but it's, it's, um, it's got an HMI on it and I use the thumb wheel and I push the buttons and all that kind of stuff. And, and I got used to that and it's very, it's very, a very good feel to that. So I want the same type of thing on here. I also want the control I can, I can have by sending it my G code file, but I'd really like to run this in a complete manual mode and be able to do machining uh, with just that. And a couple reasons, you know, I'm gonna have people coming over borrowing this machine, using it right here in my, in my shop. And uh, actually my wife is excited about this. She wants to learn how to do it. So I'm, we're not gonna go down the whole route of all the drawing for her. I just give her a knob and let her go for it. So let's talk a lot about what's going on here with this thing. I started looking at all the wiring that, that was going to be involved and where I'm going to put everything. Um, you know, power supply. Uh, where am I going to put my HMI interface on my, on my thing here? It needs to be part of this platform. It needs to go up and down. Um, <clears throat> what kind of wire? How many, how many wires do I actually need? 
And that's where I ended up stopping because it, it got complicated. Um, I needed to document every trace on my work bee for everything, including my mist system, my probing system, all the limit switches, the controller, uh, power supply, uh, my um, e-stop, all that. I had to get it all down so that I know where the wires are going to go. So don't take it apart all, all the time as I had to figure all that out. Because I started getting my wire out and I got, oh, I got some uh, four, four conductor 22 gauge. Unshielded. Shielded three conductor 22 gauge. And I got this monster here. Ten conductors. Shielded 24 gauge. That's 22 as well. All right. What do I wire up here? So I came up with this big drawing. I'll show you this here in a minute on the computer. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to talk about the physical things of it here. So I haven't done any wiring on this yet. Well, let me get this over here. <clears throat> All right, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have my HMI be located right here. And, you know, I'd like to have a, a, a real tactile one. Um, no touch screen, no touch anything on it. And so I have a little mock-up here. I've, I got a cardboard box. And I got lots of switches and everything back there. But I got, a, I have a bunch of these from a, left over from a project. These are little buttons that I think... These were used in a telco application where they wanted to do, um, you know, they wanted to do touch tone buttons. And these have a really good feel to them. And uh, they have a hole on the back side so I could put an LED right in the back and kind of backlit light the, light the front of these. And then I have one of these jog wheels. And I have my, this is my uh, feed override. Uh, knob on a, on a real CNC machine. This is traditionally a 21 position rotary switch. Uh, a single pole, single pole, yeah, single pole, 21 positions. Those are fairly expensive, and then I need to be able to route it into my, my microprocessor. And then I have a bunch of these other switches as well. Remember, I'm still using Gerbil, but I want this interface to be hooked on to my Gerbil board and I don't want to use another processor. I want to keep and stay on this uh, PSOC 5. So this, all this stuff needs to be interfaced in. This particular jog wheel has got a, a, a quadrature output for A, B and I can tell which way I'm going. These are just straight push buttons. Uh, pretty straightforward. But I do have the backlighting that I need to control as well. Uh, I'm not using that uh, a uh, rotary switch. I'm actually using a uh, old school <laughs> analog potentiometer. And then these are these bigger buttons over here are for like um, feed hold and uh, cycle start, as well as a soft reset on the Gerbil side. So I need to be able to wire this in to here. Well, this has got all the hardware interfaces to actually interface. All this stuff for my for my uh, HMI right in here, and uh, you know, like the quadrature decoder, there's a there's a component in the library to do that, and so uh, hardware figures all that out, and then I just pull it every once in a while and figure out where I am, or I can set up an interrupt for whenever the knob turns, you know, makes a change in position. Um, then I get an interrupt. And the processor, because it's running Gerbil, it has um, my, my extra code for my HMI has the ability to actually inject G code that Gerbil understands into the Gerbil processor, you know, into the parser um, and uh, uh, directly. And it doesn't have to route it out through a serial port and route it back in again. It could just make the function call or stick it right on the, um, uh, they call it the uh, receive buffer. We can just stick it right on the end of the receive buffer like it had come in from an external uh, HMI. All right, let's see where I am on my timing because this stupid camera shuts off at 25 minutes. I am at, well, I'm at a good point. Let me stop here and I'll continue on. 
uh, just a minute. Wow, good timing on that one. I went up to turn the camera off and it turned off by itself because I was like, like 29 and 50 seconds. All right, let's continue on. Let's keep going. So over here, I have a limited set of functions. I can change the units, you know, from millimeters to inches. I can uh, zero the axis. I can do axis selection, X, Y, and Z, with these three push buttons up here. And I'll just illuminate which one I'm, what, what this actual jog wheel is actually moving. And uh, my feed, my feed knob down here, um, Gerbil 1.1 supports uh, feed overrides uh, and we're in real time as a real time feed change. Um, and it does that on the next uh, step cycle. So it's really fast in, in how fast it actually changes the feed rates. Uh, I did a lot of, re I did a lot of um, poking around Gerbil code to figure out how it did that. And I'll be able to make the function calls directly to modify those, those variables for Gerbil kind of behind the scenes and kind of sneak them in. So my code that's interfacing with my HMI here will, will manipulate Gerbil much the way that the parser does internal to Gerbil. It just does it doesn't have to go through the parser. So I have a, several ways of actually manipulating my bits back and forth. Okay, <clears throat> there's one additional thing I want to have. So a lot of these home machines will have a pendant. Um, you know, pendant something. This is like a pendant. This one's actually physically going to be mounted here. But you can buy these. You know, you can buy these right now for a hundred bucks, or you know, depending on what you want to get. You can get a wireless one, and it has a jog wheel on it, some switches, and that kind of thing. Um, but I want to interface it back into a one, single gerbil board. I don't want it to be USB. Uh, a lot of those are USB, so they're meant to go into something like Mach 3 or, or something like that, and then they feed in commands into Mach 3. Mach 3 takes the, modifies its routine. Right, I don't have this, I don't want to introduce US, a USB uh, subsystem into this because then uh, I, I eat up a lot of those digital blocks that I want to use because it needs to implement the USB hardware in this generic blocks and I don't want to I don't want to do that um, so <clears throat> uh, and they have serial ones that that are just straight serial ones and then also have ones that just have a bunch of wires sticking out you can wire those in and then you're you're on one of these um, you know, like those old corded phones is that has a pigtail in it that's kind of curly uh, and then you can come or kind of come around and do that uh, but uh, if you're going to kind of position your, your work piece and you're going to be doing zeroing and that kind of thing, you've you got to hold this in one hand and then you're going to turn it with another. Uh, so having this set up is a lot easier because it's going to be mounted right here out of the way so I have full, I have full uh, my full work surface. This is going to be sitting here so when you're working, You'll be able to reach over here and turn the jog wheel and actually have your your one of your hands free to do other things in in your in your work area. Uh, one of the decisions I had to make was: Do I put my my guy over here on for my lefty, or do I put it over here on the right so I can do so I can turn the jog wheel with my right hand? Um, that actually was a pretty big decision because it affects the routing of all the wires in here because there's a ton of wires going to come into here because I'm going to put the PSOC controller inside this box. Uh, so I opted to have my left hand do the jog wheel. Uh, I did learn to do lefty mouse when I was in college because I screwed up my wrist. So I don't think I'll have a problem with lefty wheel. and. Uh, Rob over at his machine shop actually has left and right hand to drive, uh, you know, HMIs on some of his machines. I went over today and I, I, I played around with a lot of those and I think a left-handed wheel is going to be fine. All right, one last thing on there before we get over to the computer side is I've done projects on the Arduino in the past where I've used uh, infrared remotes uh, to control uh, to control things and 
There, on the Arduino side, there's a uh, IR library that uh, uses subsequent interrupts to um, look at the timing of IR pulses coming out of common remote controls. Uh, you know, a common protocol is RC5, and then there's an NEC one, there's a Sony, there's RC6. There's a lot of different uh, remote control protocols for over IR. And um, I have, I've used this guy in the past. This is a DISH network uh, remote. And I did a lot of research for a company I worked for before, and we actually, this was our HMI interface for a mechanical system, I added in this, this code uh, using the IR library on Arduino to control a physical process. And we use these. Now, why did we, why did we pick this? Because you can buy this at any Walmart back at the, in the, that time. You can buy it. Uh, and these are extremely inexpensive. I guess, uh, you know, this is, this is a really popular uh, one that gets replaced a lot, a lot in homes. Well, I think so. It, you know, this was probably six years ago, but I have a lot of these left over. And they're still pretty popular in terms of you can find them. There's a lot of buttons on here. And this guy uh, doesn't, doesn't adhere to any of those protocols, unfortunately. So I spent a little while, and I'm going to have a video about this separately. Uh, but I did get a, a hardware version of a decoder. So no software for to do the uh, acquisition of the bit pattern coming off of this wrist remote. So this is an additional mechanism at which I'll be able to control my machine. And so I did a, I did a fairly good mapping of the buttons on here to the Gerbil, um, Gerbil jogging uh, mode. And I'll be able to control every, almost a lot of things on here uh, by just using this as my, my, my wireless pendant. You know, so I can have things like X, Y, Z. I can pick the axis X, Y, Z on my little uh, gaming buttons down here, my colored gaming buttons. Um, I'll be able to change the feed rates. I'll be able to change the. Uh, I'll be able to be able to enter in actual um, a G code from here, primarily you know uh, G G one codes. Um, uh, what well, we learned last week, G0 is a very bad thing on my machine because these machines, these motors are so fast. So G1, I'll be able to do G1 commands uh, just from here by, by typing that in. So if I want to do a little bit more things beyond just my straight uh, HMI interface over here, I just pick up this remote and I can actually, you know, do, you know, don't have to bring out another computer or set up another interface to actually control this from uh, from G from G commands. Oh, wow, that was a lot. Okay. Oh, there's one last thing. <laughs> I have one of these Nextian uh, displays. This is a, um, a graphical uh, LCD display that's got a resistive touchscreen membrane on it. And this is a little different than your normal um, you program this a little bit differently than your normal uh, thing for on the on the in the Arduino world. This guy here is uh, this is I think the 3.5 inch version, or is that 4.3? No, I don't. I think this is the 3.5 inch version, and it's a 4 480 by 240 dots or something RGB. And um, you don't use. Uh, graphics libraries with this. Uh, if if I were to add like a tradition, you know, like most common Arduino projects use these things over SPI, and they send out, you know, complete screen refreshes over SPI, you know, which bits are on and which bits are off. And then the microprocessor has a graphics library where it knows how to draw buttons, it knows how to draw fields, it knows how to draw fonts, it knows how to do all that stuff. And it basically creates a, uh, a, an off-screen buffer, writes into that on a periodic basis, you know, say 10, 10 times a second. And then it takes that and it does a memory dump right out to the display. And that's a lot of communication back and forth. 
Now, remember, the primary purpose of my, my little Gerbil board is to control this machine in real time, not to keep a display updated. So what do I do? What, how do I do that? Well, that's where this thing comes in. This is a Nexian display. So this thing has a, a microprocessor on the back and it has a development environment where you build all your graphical interfaces over here and you code it into this thing. And then it has a very simple protocol to update your, your screen widget. So like, say you have a, 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 a field, you have a field widget and you want to change its value. You have a slider widget. You have a, a, um, a gauge widget. Uh, you want to change the backgrounds. You want to do different type of pages, so to speak. Uh, you can put all that in here, and then you can control which page is displayed, and then you can update the widgets on here by just using a simple serial command. So you want to, you know, you'll be on, let's say we're on the jog page, and we have our machine position, actually our workpiece position, on here as X, Y, and Z. And then as this is moving, periodically I grab out all the values for X, Y, and Z in the current work system. And I just send over a serial command to update those widgets. I don't write the whole screen. So these are incredibly fast in terms of that. And the load on the processor is very small over here because these UARTs on here have a buffer uh, you can make the output buffer on a one of these uh, t uh, transmit only UARTs up to a, a really large number this has a lot of RAM in it so you can make it like let's say you make it a thousand characters long so you could just you your um, you grab out the values from the real-time portion of Gerbil you format up a string, you, you're going to stringify it a little bit you know, for the protocol that this Nexian display is expecting. And then you just load it into the buffer and that's it. So all your update code is just doing that string stringifying of the values. And then once it's in the buffer, then the hardware takes over here and funnels that out at, at 115k baud. All right, so the, I think the overhead to do the, the screen update from here is very small. It's certainly better than hammering the Gerbil status with a question mark all the time because there is a limitation on how fast Gerbil can respond to uh, status queries uh, over the serial port. And uh, they recommend on the Gerbil site to not do that any faster than five hertz. So five times a second, you're, you can ask it for status. Any more than that, and you're bogging down the processor with all this formatting. Um, it's not going to it's not going to affect the um, the position algorithm or the timing of that because that's all interrupt driven. But in order for it to do other things, if it's if you're hammering it to get an update, you you um, uh, it's just bad bad news. So with this approach of using this display and hooking it internally and not going through the processor mechanism. The plus, it, in fact, is running at 80 megahertz over 8, or 16 for the, for the, for the Arduino. Um, we should be able to handle that small amount of interface uh, or of, of overhead uh, to the um, process itself. Right, well, I've talked a lot um, today. I'm going to hop over to the computer and show you uh, all the routing for the wires and then I'll just kind of wrap this up um, I know we just really go long and turn this camera on I'm gonna start whack I'm gonna start yakking about a bunch of stuff but you know I think that if you're here you want to learn about you know things I found so that when you build your work be you you will know a little bit about different things that, that I found as well all right let's go in and uh, get on the computer and I'll show you a few things over there and then I'll come back here and conclude Here's my wiring diagram for my work bee. I'll kind of tell you a little bit about what's going on here. I have a bunch of wires along the, they're along an edge like this. That means they got to run in the edge or along the edge. And so I have my Y uh, left motor and Y right motor in the back. And so I need to run a bunch of wires up to here. And then these two motors are connected together because they have a same, same stick sequence. 
So I need to cross run them together and I'll probably run those in this back piece of extrusion here. And here is the, you know, this is the, the Y, it, this is that 20, uh, the, the C beam. Um, all these wires over here are what can, are what's going to get uh, put into the drag chain that goes back and forth when, when my when my platform moves in Y. All these wires need to go up to up in here, or they need to control the X motor. So X motor on mine is going to be on the left hand side of the machine, and my like I said, my uh, HMI interface, my controller is going to be down here on the bottom left as well. So I have a bunch of wires in uh, in the drag chain uh, going up, and we're splitting off some of them over to the X motor. And then the rest of these have to go inside the drag chain that runs along the back side of my x-axis up to the z-axis itself. So we will start, uh, I don't know where we want to start. I do have a little legend down here. I have analog, digital, power, other, and AC wires. I'll talk about why the AC is there and how the e-stop is actually going to function. So let's we'll start up here and, uh, well, let's, let's start with limit switches. So I have the Y limit switches here along the left hand side in the front uh, and the back. The X limit switches are up here at the, on the edges of this C beam up here. And then I have one Z limit switch uh, down here underneath the, underneath the extrusion on the, the Z axis here. My Z motor, my spindle is here, and my probe is going to stick out down here. And a lot of times, you're going to run a probe. It's uh, you're going to run it back over to the controller. Um, so I have two options here. I can run these wires in all these drag chains. This might be an analog signal. It might just be a digital signal. Either way, I'm going to so I'm going to subsequently treat this wiring as a as an analog wire. So it'll be a piece of shielded cable uh, and so <clears throat> let's just kind of zoom in on this guy here so I have my M plus M minus are my, my my high voltage high voltage higher voltage that actually runs the motors in my case it's 36 volts and I got Z step Z direction and a ground reference up here now, I don't have a motor enable I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute <clears throat> I have that little Display here, the Nexian display. It needs VCC plus five and ground and a serial connection. So I have the display TX and RX. I got my Z limit switch here, which goes to ground and Z limit. My jack for my probe. And I may want to put a USB camera up here to have exciting, exciting uh, you know, video shots of me routing. <laughs> And my uh, my air, my compressed air for cleaning out the, uh, the the chips out of the work area. All that's coming over here. A similar type of arrangement for all the all the motors. You got X direction and X step, as well as the M plus and M minus. Same up here on the on the Y the Y motors as well. All right, let's go down here. Look at this. Let's uh, kind of look at this block over here. If I can. Get this to go over here. This is what's going to be housed in that box. So we'll talk a lot uh, about this. So I'm going to have a jog wheel here. I'm going to have a feed override. And uh, this is going to be real time feed override. And I'm going to be able to have X selection, Y selection, Z selection. Uh, going to be able to zero the axis the, in the current selected. Um, uh, coordinate system and whether or not uh, it's in um, uh, millimeters or it's in metric or standard. Uh, it's I'm going to have the ability to change how much the wheel itself actually moves. This typically on a CNC machine I got them labeled as speed low, speed medium, speed high. That's not actually right. This should be x, x times 1 is, is times 1 times 10 and times 100. And that's going to basically run how f how far a single click on my wheel is going. 
These are the common three buttons a Gerbil system has. You have feet hold, feet start, and reset. And then I have a USB connection down here for the external uh, com uh, computer that's going to send G-code over to it. And in the future, I may want to put a display over here as well. I uh, want a little I squared C display because I can, in the PSOC, I can have an I squared C transmitter where it handles all the I squared C communications. I just basically put a packet and I can just actually do it through DMA if, if, I, if I want to. And if there's enough space left over in here, I like to just put an SD card interface in here and then be able to actually pull the G code right off the SD card. Then it'll be a completely standalone machine with manual as well as automated control. Over here, I run my uh, run a 36 volt power supply, and I'm going to bring that in and step it down with a with a uh, switching power supply down to plus five. And I'm going to put my e-stop switch right here, and I'm going to kill the power to the motors. Because this is a uh, lead screw system, um, I'm not going to ever want to spin those lead screws manually. And so if the power is on, I'll just go ahead and have the motors enabled all the time. And there's a, there's a good reason for that. <clears throat> if I have the motors enabled this particular all the time this particular board can go through a power cycle and I will not actually lose the physical position uh, if I disable the motors and bring them back online again I might move in position a little bit because of the micro stepping involved I, I won't be on a stepping interval of the of the stepper motor I'm going to have a motor current sense circuit here. This is uh, one of those Allegro uh, was it, ACS 712s, which is a, a loop sensor for both DC as well as AC uh, current sensing. And I'll be able to sense up, I think I have the, uh, I either have the 5 volt or the 20, or 5 amp or 20 amp um, one. And it puts out an analog signal. And I can run that into an analog input on my PSOC board and then just have that A to D converter uh, constantly um, computing. And then I can kind of look at the load of the motors itself. Uh, I'm going to look at all of them. I'm not going to individually split out individual motors. The E stop switch, in addition to turning the motion controller, the motion motors off, it needs to kill the spindle power. So I'm going to put an AC relay in that's 24 volt power, 24 volt DC powered. And I'm going to kill the power to the spindle as well. So when you slam the e-stop switch on, it's kind of a catastrophic failure. You're going to power everything off, including the spindle. And then AC comes in down here. All right, well, that's it for that. If we want to come over and look at this other project of mine, it's called the PSOC. This is over at GitHub. This is a, a uh, my infrared control receiver using the, the PSOC hardware. And, you know, like I said, this is a direct TV transmitter, and it doesn't use a RC5 or um, the other traditional type. IR protocols, it uses the, it looks at, modifies the bit width of the bits of a, a, a one is a lot wider than a zero. And you actually measure the time between the transitions and that tells you the uh, number sequence. And it's always a 16 bit number. It doesn't have variable, um, variable message links. Here's my evaluation kit. This is called a CY8 kit 059. This has got a PSOC 5 LP on it. And this is available at uh, over at Cypress for $10 or you can get it at DigiKey or Arrow for $15. This is the hardware decoder itself. Uh, so like I said, this is all done in hardware and then when my uh, shift register shifts in the individual bits, when it gets to 16, I get an interrupt over here, and then I get then the interrupt handler grab off the command, and then I can I can uh, process it. 
and this is what PSOC Creator is a screen dump of PSOC Creator and it tells you about the resources actually allocated because you know I want to make sure that I don't allocate too many hardware resources uh, because then the the, uh, the port of Gerbil over to the PSOC is not going to function and then here's kind of the output from my, my little test project here and it basically uh, I was just pressing the buttons on my remote it's telling you which key was pressed all right, well, that's just a simple one-off baby step project that I'll take all this and incorporate it into um, into the into the PSOC Gerbil project. And this is the, um, oops, that's not me. Let's go over here. Yeah, this one here. This is the PSOC Gerbil um, port. And this here is about a year old. I've talked to this guy, and uh, his name is, I think his name is Bart. And I asked him uh, if he's got any new updates for this. And uh, he said he does. And he's going to actually um, probably do a commit here at some point. And then I'll take that commit and actually start adding on to it for my control system itself. All right, well, let's go back out in the workshop, and we'll wrap this up. All right, well, that was kind of a whopper, another whopper session here, and uh, it doesn't look like I made a lot of progress, but actually I have. Um, I, I've got a lot of planning. I've done a lot of planning, and I'm ready to get this thing kind of wired up. I do have a lot of code development i got to do, which is fine. It's what I do uh, in my day job, and this is, I don't look at this as, as a chore. Um, this, cause this is exciting stuff here. Mm. <laughs> Uh, so I'm taking off and going on my annual road trip with my granddaughter on Tuesday. So I'll be out of town here for a few days and uh, I'll be back next week. This is the Valve Studio. Thanks for watching.